Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction, and it is indeed an honor to be chosen for the uh, faculty lecture. I was just uh, reminiscing that uh, 40, 50 years ago, I first came to Seattle and spent two nights sleeping in a car trying to find a job and uh, ended up not finding a job and going back down to southeast Washington to uh, pick peas. Uh, and I never dreamed at the time that I would actually be on the faculty of the university here and even more chosen to give this, uh, this lecture. Um, so I wanted to uh, start off just by emphasizing that this talk is about food. There has been so much discussion of the ocean uh, that it is, it's, it's almost rare for, for the fact that the oceans produce food to be part of the conversation. Um, so for those of you who are pressed for time, I'll give you three points and then you can leave. <laughs> um, the first is that the oceans are a very important source of food for people <clears throat> and especially some of the poorest people in the world. That when we look at the abundance of fish stocks, Contrary to popular opinion, uh, fish stocks are actually increasing in many places, such as the United States, uh, and they're certainly decreasing in others. And I will talk about where stocks are increasing, where they're decreasing, et cetera. Um, the bottom lesson is we can maintain and sustain food from the sea uh, with appropriate forms of fisheries management. And places that are managing their fisheries, and I will discuss that in a little bit of detail, are actually seeing very sustainable fisheries. Um, now, I just want to uh, start by saying that almost everything I talk about is the result of a team effort, and so the honor of being the faculty lecturer really should be shared by, by large groups of people that have contributed to what I'm going to talk about. And uh, by probably 20 or more than 30 years ago, one of my colleagues said to me, you know, if you want to get tenure, publish a lot of articles. But if you want to change the world and affect how other people do their science, write books. And so I wanted to start by, by thanking my uh, collaborators on the three uh, major books we, uh, I've done with them. First is Carl Walters, who was a mentor when I was an, a graduate student at University of British Columbia, remains a good friend and mentor. The second book uh, was uh, Mark Mangle, who's a professor at University of California, Santa Cruz, and last, I want to thank my wife, Ulrika, who um, was the, uh, helped me and is the, uh, it's, a, it's a book, Ray Hilborn with Ulrika Hilborn. Uh, she turned my scientific writing into something that the public can understand. Um, I also want to especially thank, I have to say, my two most significant collaborators in the work I will talk about over the last 10 years. And they're Chris Costello on the left, who's a professor at University of California, Santa Barbara, and Anna Parma on the right, who is a researcher uh, from Argentina. Uh, Chris is incredibly creative in the kinds of things he can think, think to do. Uh, Anna has the best judgment and, and, uh, of anyone I've, I've ever worked with. Um, um, and uh, just sort of somewhat coincidentally, Chris is on the board of directors of the Environmental Defense Fund, and Anna is on the board of directors of the Nature Conservancy. So their, their talents are widely recognized. Then I want to thank large groups of collaborations that I've been involved with and really lead to many of the results I'm going to talk about. So we've uh, got teams of people who are taking a particular problem, such as what is the status of fish stocks, and working over many years to do that. And these are just uh, pictures of some of those teams of people. And you'll see Chris and Anna in some of those. And in fact, you'll see Anna in almost every one of them. Um, and then I want to... Uh, that what we do and, and these teams that take and synthesize data is dependent upon large numbers of people who uh, are doing science on fisheries around the world. And I don't know any of these people, but I'm sure that we have been using the results of the work that they've done. And we, in turn, depend upon literally thousands of people out there who are doing the field work, collecting the samples, doing the surveys. Um, so one way I like to, it's sort of like a, an inverted pyramid. And these are just guesses. I'd say there are probably 20,000 people out there in the field doing, uh, collecting data on fisheries. It may be 10 times that. I, I don't, don't know. There are several thousand who are actually analyzing the data and publishing it. And then if you look at these teams, there's something like 200. So what I'm going to talk about isn't really any brilliant insight I've had. It's been the result of a lot of hard work by thousands and thousands of people. 
Uh, so I want to begin, uh, actually these are some slides I use in my undergraduate course on food. Uh, I'm an optimist, and, uh, uh, and because in, the, in, in my rather long time here on Earth, uh, my general perception is things are getting better. I know for people who are young now it might be hard to believe, but I just want to show you a few slides. Um, in the 1950s there was this new great thing called Disneyland. And uh, I lived in Northern California and my parents got together enough money to take us down to Disneyland, and that's what we saw. The air in Los Angeles was unbreathable. Your eyes started watering as soon as you came in to the Los Angeles basin. Uh, if you've flown to Los Angeles lately, most of the time it's clear you can actually see the houses and stuff. Uh, it was the same in Seattle. You couldn't swim in Lake Washington in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, the water was, was polluted. Uh, now, clearly global warming is a big threat, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but I would say it doesn't worry me as much as the threats we lived with in the 1950s. How many people have done a duck and cover drill? Really? Okay, well, you're showing your age. Um, I don't think my grandkids or my, I don't think my, my kids ever did duck and cover grill, uh, drills. We, we were living with nuclear Armageddon, so, you know, to me, a lot of things have gotten better. Um, okay, now I want to go to fish, and again, I keep wanting to emphasize that sustaining food and food security is uh, what this talk is all about, and, uh, and this is just a, a picture of uh, a market in Africa where thousands and thousands of people are depending upon, uh, upon fish for their animal, nutri for, their, for their nutrition, uh, and millions of people around the world for, the, for their incomes. Um, I was just at a meeting a few weeks ago, there was a guy from Guinea, and he said that 70% of the animal protein in, in, eaten in Guinea is, is, comes from capture fisheries. Um, on the global scale, capture fisheries produce more animal protein than beef. Um, they produce a little less than chicken or pork. Aquaculture is roughly comparable, but growing, and I think within 10 or 15 years, aquaculture will probably out, out, uh, pass, pass all of those things. But it is a very important part of the global food system. And as I talk about the threats to the sustainability of food, uh, of, of fisheries, if that piece of the pie was to disappear, some combination of people uh, going very hungry and having very poor nutrition or producing more beef, chicken, or pork are really uh, the, what, what the alternatives are. So. I've been very lucky uh, in working uh, in, in, over my career in a number of fisheries that are generally regarded as the most sustainable in the world, and probably the best thing that ever happened to me professionally was getting to work up in Alaska, um, where both we have a fantastic team of people and it is an incredibly beautiful place. Um, and it has some of the most sustainable fisheries uh, in the world. This is just a map of where Bristol Bay is in Alaska. Uh, but I, can I figure this out? Um, maybe, maybe not. Whoops, that wasn't what I wanted. Um, well, I won't, I won't, I won't risk it. Um, but as I say, all these things are results of team. This is a picture we took a few years ago of the people who had been working uh, on our Alaska program. So it's a very large, very team effort, and I know there's at least half a dozen people in the room who are in that picture. This is just the history of catch from Bristol Bay, uh, that industrial fishing started, go, the native fishing goes back thousands and thousands of years. Industrial fishing started with the first canneries in 1893. Uh, there have been uh, major ups and downs, but since the late 1970s, uh, the, 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 the total catch and the total return of salmon has been extremely high. We just, uh, we just had two very, very large runs. Uh, we're due for a, for a, a downturn of some kind, but uh, there's certainly uh, no question that this fishery is managed in a way that it can be sustained. Um, I've also been lucky enough to work since 1990 uh, in New Zealand, uh, often taking groups of students there uh, to help do assessments of the, of, the, of the status of the stocks. And New Zealand is also held out by most of the world's fisheries community as one of the very well-managed place. Never really had significant overfishing. It's had some, but not a lot. And uh, very late in developing, the big industrial fisheries in New Zealand didn't begin until the 1980s. Um, and it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
there's just no question that the fisheries in New Zealand can be sustained in the way that they're managed. And again, all of the data from New Zealand depend, this is a picture they put together a couple years ago of all the people that had contributed just to the analysis of the data, and I'm in there somewhere, and a whole bunch of my friends and colleagues are as well. So why the doom and gloom? Uh, you know, if you, if you were to do a reading of newspapers or, or magazines, you would think that all the world's fisheries are collapsing and emptying, and, and the oceans are being emptied, and a lot of that uh, goes back to, uh, I've, I've had sort of two aha moments in, the, uh, in, in the, what I'm going to talk about today. And the first one came in 2006 when there was an article published in Science Magazine that said if current trends continue, all fish stocks will be collapsed by 2048. Um, I could still point you to 100 references a year uh, on social media, NGO websites that will, will talk about that and say, yeah, all, you know, all the fish stocks are going to be gone by, by mid-century. And that was so contrary to my experience in Alaska, my experience in New Zealand, my experience in Western Pacific tuna, uh, et cetera, that uh, I, among quite a few others, wrote a critique of that. Uh, of that oh, wait, sorry. I am jumped ahead of myself. Um, that was taken up by popular media. So this is a Time Magazine article in November of 2006, just after that article came out. You know, oceans are nothing. Study says overfishing will soon destroy the seafood supply. Um, so anyway, I ended up on a national public radio show with the lead author of that paper uh, named Boris Worm, who's there standing in front of me. And we started, a, I, I didn't know him at the time, but it was pretty clear that we could talk and try to understand why we had such different perceptions. And uh, we, had, we kicked around a number of ideas. Uh, one of them was that he was, uh, his experience had been in the North Atlantic, which was a place where there had been lots and lots of overfishing. Mine had mostly been in the Pacific. Um, another was that, uh, that, um, that he had typically worked uh, very close inshore, and I had been typically worked with fisheries that were uh, were offshore and less impacted by human activity. Um, I think I, I think in reality, a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was coming from the perspective of the oceans providing food. He was coming from the, or fisheries providing food. He was coming from the perspective of fisheries fisheries changing the biodiversity of the ocean, and so any fishing was intrinsically bad, uh, whereas I was coming from the perspective that fishing is the way we produce food in the ocean. But anyway, we tried to understand why we had such different perspectives, and the, the paper they wrote was based solely on looking at catch trends, and they would look at the, at the catch of, uh, of fish uh, in, in the United States and say the catch is declining, therefore the populations must be going down, when in fact the catch was often declining because we were regulating the fisheries uh, tighter and tighter. And Boris realized, and I realized, that what we needed to do was look at the abundance of fish stocks. What's actually happening to the abundance of fish stocks? And we, we uh, ended up putting this big group together, and you'll see Anna Parma in the front row there, um, and, uh, and generated, found all the data we ca could have, either on scientific surveys of abundance or uh, where agencies take all the data that are available, catch data, survey data, uh, catch and age data, length data, and estimate the uh, trends in abundance. And we produced a paper uh, also in science in, uh, in 2009, so the process took about three years, uh, that was much more optimistic. The title was Rebuilding Global Fisheries. And what we showed is that whether you're dealing with scientific assessments or surveys, that we really couldn't find an overall downward trend, uh, that the fish stocks appeared to be stable. Um, and uh, since that time, uh, we, we, one of the databases we built was a database of all the, the fish stocks that are assessed by scientific groups around the world. And at the time of that paper, we had about 20% of the world's catch represented in those stocks. Since that time, we have been maintaining and, bu and building this database. We call it the 
RAM Legacy Database because Ransom Myers was the uh, first person to try to build a big global database. Uh, he was a colleague of, um, well, I'd, I'd certainly worked with him and he was a colleague with Boris in Eastern Canada and RAM died while we were doing this project and it's the RAM Legacy Stock Assessment Database. We've continued to add to that database uh, in the last 10 years and uh, Actually, I'm, I'm on Ford, we have a new release that will be available literally any day now. I'm hoping to have my hands on it next week. I was hoping to use that to update some of these slides. Uh, this shows the global coverage as of about a year ago. And the size of the circle represents the catch of fish from the country. And what's in green is how much of it comes from stocks that we have scientific assessments of. And you'll see for the US and most of Europe, um, much of uh, Peru and Chile, Argentina, we've got pretty good coverage. Um, Africa doesn't have a lot of big fisheries. Morocco and South Africa have the biggest, uh, and we have uh, most of their big stocks there. Um, Japan's okay, Russia's okay. It's Southeast, Southeast Asia we have at the time and we continue to have almost no scientific assessments from those regions. So here's the big picture. If we put it all together, this is our current best estimate of the total abundance of fish stocks starting in about 1950. Uh, of total abundance of harvested fish stocks when uh, really industrial fishing really took off. And the green line is the average estimate of the target level if you want to maximize food production. That is, uh, and so what we see is that as industrial fisheries developed, on average, stocks moved down and down to just about the level on average where uh, food production be maximized. And since then, they've actually started to increase. Now, I want to emphasize this is only for the stocks that are scientifically assessed. And everything we know suggests that they are in better shape in general than stocks that are not scientifically assessed. Um, this is. Uh, this is why it has that shape. This is the fishing pressure. Essentially, what fraction of the fish stocks are harvested each year? And it increased from the 1950s to the mid-1980s, and it's been going down ever since. So that's why stocks are starting to rebuild, is because we've been reducing not the catch. I mean, we've been reducing the catch for sure, but it's reducing the fraction that we're harvesting overall that has led to stock stabilizing and then rebuilding. Uh, I'm just going to quickly run through a few regions. The, the bottom message here is that the pattern is very different in different regions. Most of the regions we have good data on are actually doing, uh, doing OK. This is the US West Coast. You see, again, decline in the 70s, 80s. Through the 1990s, Magnuson-Stevens Act kicked in. Uh, stocks have been increasing. Um, Alaska's uh, something of an exception in that there really has been no decline in the abundance of fish stocks. In fact, if anything, an increase. And Alaska has really not seen any significant amount of, uh, of overfishing or stock depletion. Uh, U.S. East Coast, it's sort of the, the kicking boy of U.S. fisheries. Uh, very big declines in the 1980s and 90s. Very high proportion of stocks overfished at that time, but very significant recovery since then. Southeastern Gulf, again, fishing down in the 70s and 80s, a picture of, of recovery since then. Canada East Coast, source of the famous cod collapse. You see that there in the late 80s and 90s. Um, not a lot of recovery yet. Uh, uh, the big cod stock is recovering. The cod stocks are recovering, but, uh, but slowly. Um, although the interesting feature of eastern Canada is the value of their fisheries increased when the stocks uh, declined, basically because you got rid of cod and ground fish, and that let the, the lobsters, the crabs, the scallops, and the shrimp have boomed. And now they're seeing shrimp closures. And I heard what I thought was unthinkable uh, talk about, well, do we really want to rebuild the cod? Um, but I think cod is so important culturally in eastern Canada that there's no question that that's going to happen. Uh, Norway, Iceland, and Faroe Islands, uh, or I should say, size of the circle represents how many stocks are involved. They have reasonably few stocks, but very big, valuable ones. Nor and and they, uh, they, again, saw declines in the 80s, and they've been rebuilding ever since. And they have very little overfishing going on in those, those places now. The European Union Atlantic fisheries, 
were uh, ten cents late to come to the party. They were still declining as late as 2000. They had a major change in, uh, in, in management policy about 2006, and that started to see rebuilding of their stocks. Russia and Japan, downward 10 through the 80s and 90s, uh, some rebuilding since 2000. South America, uh, declining in the 90s, and uh, some indication they've stabilized. They've certainly started to improve the fisheries management system, but no, no sign of rebuilding there. So, and we've, we've got quite a few other regions, but the basic picture is that some places were never overfished, and um, Alaska and New Zealand stand out as having never seen large amounts of overfishing, that sort of collectively the stocks were, uh, were not overfished. Uh, and I personally ascribe that to the fact that they both came, had fisheries that developed late, and they had been able to learn the lessons largely from the North Atlantic. Um, some were overfished and now recovering, U.S. East Coast, uh, European Atlantic. Um, some continue to be overfished. Uh, we don't have the data in, the, we didn't have the data in the RAM legacy at the time, but we now have it for the Mediterranean fish stocks. Um, essentially, everything in the Mediterranean is overfished except bluefin tuna, which is doing quite well. Um, where we don't have assessment data, we generally believe the status is poor, and I'll, I'll show you some uh, of that. Um, and even in well-managed places, there are stocks that are in poor condition. That is, they're at low abundance. Some of it's due to ineffective management. Uh, some of it's due to natural variability. I just show you an, a, a, a regional example, a West Coast example. This is from a recent paper on the collapse of uh, three species on the West Coast, anchovy, sardine, and hake. And these are from paleo records that is long before industrial fishing began, and just showing that all three of these stocks have showed periods of collapse, that these are highly variable stocks. Sardines are once again down in the toilet. They're, the fishery's been closed for several years. But uh, the, the, the collapse of sardines is, uh, is totally due to natural conditions. Uh, and uh, I mean, fishing accelerated the initial decline, then they closed the fishery. Um, and it will come back when the environmental conditions tell it it's time to come back. Um, so one of the really surprising things from our analysis is that if we look at the current rate of exploitation, we can say, well, how much more yield could we get? And uh, Chris Costello and I have just published a paper that contains some of this data. Um, and uh, again, here showing by uh, region or country, the size of the circle is the potential long-term yield. In green is how much you would obtain at the current exploitation rates, and in yellow is how much you would, uh, could increase by fishing the stocks that are currently fished at low rates harder. And so you see for, for the, almost all the US and most of Europe, most of the potential increase in yield doesn't come from fishing less, it actually comes from fishing more. Um, now, in South America, that's not the case, and Russia and Japan, it's not the case. Um, and the fact is that, that most of the European and American countries have now adopted conservative enough management that the, the loss in long-term yield is coming from fishing lightly rather than fishing too hard. Okay, but, and to those of you from the Alaska Salmon Program, I apologize for this picture. Um, this is not a very good picture of a sockeye salmon. But uh, assessed stocks only constitute about 50% of the global catch. So the question is, what's going on with the other, uh, the other uh, stocks? And Chris Costello led a team of us uh, to try to estimate the status of stocks that are currently unassessed. Uh, and we got it up to 70%. Um, and this is the, from that, that paper, this is our estimate of the total abundance of fish in the ocean, now we got it in metric tons, um, of those harvested species that constitute 70% of global catch. And what you see is, as all of the other studies show, a decline, a decline, but now we estimate stability since uh, the late 1990s. Um, interestingly enough, this is the harvested species, uh, the people who do ecosystem models suggest that in most places there has been a compensatory increase in unharvested species. So uh, there's probably, uh, particularly in temperate regions, there's probably as many tons of fish in the ocean now as there were back in 1950 or 1960. Um, 
Whoops. So if you take the Costello et al. paper and say, how many stocks are in different status? The brown in the bottom is stocks that are collapsed or crashed. Red is stocks that are overfished. And this is just the total proportion, giving each stock equal weight. Yellow is stocks that are what we would typically call fully exploited, that is, in the range of harvesting that will produce close to long-term yield. Um, and then blue and green are stocks that are either undeveloped or, uh, or, uh, or just totally uh, very, very little fishing. And so the optimist in me says, look at this, we've got, uh, you know, the majority of stocks are being managed in a way that produces somewhere near maximum sustainable yield. That's why the potential increases just aren't that much. Uh, there's still a reserve of stocks that we really haven't started to exploit, and then we have about 20, uh, this analysis came up with 20%, a number of others, 30% of stocks that are overfished or, or collapsed. Um, now, a lot of, uh, of alarmists, well, and this is one of the things that drives me crazy, they'll say, oh no, look at the oceans. 80% of stocks are overfished, collapsed, or fully exploited. And, and you know, what I want to say is, yes, and the purpose of almost all fisheries management in the world is to fully exploit stocks. That is not a problem. It does not mean stocks are going extinct. It means we're managing them in a way that we can uh, produce somewhere near the maximum amount of food. And, uh, and, and again, a lot of people equate overfished with going extinct. One marine species is documented to have gone extinct. One species in the whole, one marine fish species, sorry, there's um, some birds and mammals that have gone extinct, but one marine fish species has gone extinct. There's certainly some others, but none of them are, com uh, are commercially exploited stocks that are really in any, uh, any serious danger. Uh, there's mostly a bycatch and things like that. So, can food from the sea be sustained? Sustained. Certainly U.S., Iceland, Norway, New Zealand, there's just no question that the environment willing, the management system will produce sustainability. European Atlantic system is increasing rapidly in, in quality. Uh, Japan, Latin America, they've got farther to go. Uh, particularly bad, as I mentioned, is the Mediterranean. And unassessed, but probably bad, is most of, most of South and Southeast Asia. And that's where a lot of current scientific interest is going, is, is what is the status of those stocks? What can be done to improve their fisheries management? I um, just want to mention that if, you, uh, if you're into uh, the, the popular media, uh, Patagonian toothfish, orange ruffy, Atlantic bluefin tuna have been uh, sort of classic icons of fisheries failure. Um, the uh, Marine Stewardship Council is widely recognized as the, uh, the gold standard of certification of being sustainably managed. Um, and uh, it, it was formed by a, um, a consortium of the World Wildlife Fund and, uh, and Unilever. Um, both Patagonian toothfish and orange ruffy, the majority of those stocks are now certified by the Marine Stewardship Council. Atlantic bluefin tuna, particularly the Mediterranean stock, is building rapidly, and I would expect it to go into certification fairly soon. Um, so that's the status. Now, what do we know about how fisheries are managed? Uh, and so part of, one of, part of all these, these teams I talked about, we've been putting together a database on the management of fisheries, and we just had a paper that came out on that um, this year. This was a, a survey of people who know about how fisheries are managed in different countries being very nuts and bolts. You ask, say, okay, but first we give them a particular species in their country and say, well, do you collect landings data? Do you collect body size or age data? Do you have surveys? Uh, do you st do stock assessments? Um, we, a question, we had a whole series of questions on enforcement. Uh, do you do dockside monitoring or at sea observers? Do you protect sensitive habitats? Do you have measures to uh, reduce bycatch and discards? Um, and so it was about a 46 question questionnaire. And we did that for the 28 largest fishing countries in the world. And so this is just a map of showing how intensely fisheries are managed. And what you see is for the US and Europe, uh, and the industrial fisheries of South Africa and uh, New Zealand, um, 
those fisheries that most of the boxes are checked. They're doing most of that stuff. These also correspond with the places that seem to have the best fishery status. Um, particularly bad. The worst country in the world that we surveyed is Myanmar. Uh, it essentially has no fisheries management system. Uh, all of South and Southeast Asia, south of, uh, uh, are, are, appear to be problematic. Uh, south America, Brazil, is, uh, is, is, stands out as a problem. Um, and then we also asked in this survey, totally independent of our other work, well, what's the status of the stocks? Is it good, is it bad? And it, it maps quite straightforward onto the, uh, the big picture. The places that have uh, good fisheries management systems tend to have uh, the stocks in good shape. The places that don't have them tend to have the stocks in, 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 in less good shape. Um, but this is based on expert opinion. Um, so several things emerge from that analysis of things that really are correlated with good stock status. One is that they are scientifically assessed, that actually somebody's paying attention to what's going on. Uh, then the question is, does the management system change fishing pressure in response to changes in abundance? If stocks go down, do you reduce the amount of fishing? And then finally, and probably the most important, is do they enforce regulations. And that's sort of the big problem with Southeast Asia and say a lot of, uh, of Africa, is they have no effective enforcement. They, can, they could do the science, they could set the regulations, but no one's paying attention to them. Um, so where we stand now is that we have scientific assessments for about 1,200 fish stocks that constitute about 50% of global catch. Uh, methods such as the one that Chris Costello pioneered add another 20% or so uh, and we can use expert opinion to fill in another 10 or 15 percent. So for the majority of the world's fish catch, we have an idea of what's going on. But there are thousands and thousands of small-scale fisheries, and these fisheries are important to the food security and employment uh, of, of, of people who, uh, who depend on them, and, and they, they need new science and they need management approaches. Uh, but as I'll discuss in a little bit, the approaches we use in the developed countries really won't work for a number of reasons. Uh, so this is just a picture of classic small-scale fishing, in this case on the, on the, on the coast of Chile, uh, where there are tens of thousands of people involved in this fishery. Um, so the question is, how do we manage those, uh, those small-scale fisheries? Um, that when you just count and look at every stock, most of the fisheries are like that, and they don't have scientific surveys, they don't have catch at age data, they can't afford the kind of top-down management that has worked so well in the US, Norway, Iceland, uh, et cetera. Um, also, you have people who are very dependent upon those fisheries. They have no alternatives, and it's a major area of research of many teams like the ones I've described, trying to understand how we can do science and management for those fisheries. Okay, now I want to come to my second aha moment. And this happened, I know, I know the day. It was the 7th of January, 2010. And um, I'm actually not a fisheries biologist by training. I did my PhD on uh, rodents. Um, and I, uh, and I, I still maintain my finger in the, in the mammal pie uh, by working in the Serengeti National Park. Um, and uh, I, I spent uh, my first sabbatical there. Um, I, had to, I had to lie a little bit. I had, when I filled out my sabbatical form, I said, I'm going to Tanzania to study the population dynamics and sustainable harvesting of Conocades terrinus, which is the wildebeest. Uh, and, but I thought, okay, you know, director uh, approved it, and then uh, this was Marsha Landl, uh, and she called me into the office, and she had this big book. She says, Fishes of the World. She says, I don't find Conocades terrinus in here. <laughs> anyway, so I've been, uh, been working uh, in the Serengeti on and off, uh, and this was Marcus Borner, who was the director of conservation programs in Africa for the Frankfurt Zoo, who's the big NGO in, uh, well, in, in certainly in, in Tanzania and Serengeti. And uh, he actually just won the Blue Planet Award last year. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure why, because the Serengeti has never been described as blue. Uh, but uh, he, he showed me this cover of this Time magazine, which was, again, all about 
all the fish of the ocean disappearing, and he said, listen, Ray, I'm a conservationist. Is it my duty to stop eating fish? And uh, so I took, I took that seriously. Sometimes you didn't take Marcus too seriously. And I said, well, Marcus, if you don't eat fish, what's the alternative? And he said, well, I'm not a vegetarian. It's beef, chicken, and pork. And I had been aware that there was a literature on things like fuel use and energy and greenhouse gases uh, comparing livestock and, and fish and a number of food items. And so I, I used their minimal uh, internet capacity while I was there to start just doing a literature search on this. Um, and uh, if you just think of what are the environmental costs of food production, water use, pollution, fertilizer, pesticides, antibiotics, soil erosion, petroleum use, greenhouse gas, biodiversity loss. These are all costs of producing food. Every form of producing food has some of those problems. Okay. So uh, question, it seems like seafood has been singled out. Uh, and why, and so how many people have a Monterey Bay card with them? Okay, I, I gave a talk here five years ago. It's about a third of the audience. Okay, so there's a lot of effort by NGOs. I think there's a hundred or more seafood advice cards, um, and the idea is they're supposed to tell you what's sustainable or not, and then you're supposed to make choices. Uh, but in fact, it's not about what I would call the core sustainability. Can we keep producing this food? Uh, it's about the environmental impacts of catching the fish. So I've highlighted here yellowfin tuna. Yellowfin tuna can be green or they can be red. And it has nothing to do with the sustainability of yellowfin tuna in terms of can we keep catching yellowfin tuna. It all has to do with the biodiversity impacts of purstain fishing versus long line or trolling. Uh, trolling. Um, so, uh, and as it happens for yellowfin tuna, uh, the methods that Monterey Bay Aquarium says are green have a much higher greenhouse gas footprint than the methods they say are red because they don't worry about greenhouse gases. But I, I will say they're starting to. Um, so this is uh, an analysis from paper that we have, uh, we're just revising, I think it's almost sure to get published, where we've uh, done a big meta-analysis on a number of environmental impacts of uh, food production or animal protein production. And so in red you have a series of aquaculture, in yellow a series of livestock, and in blue a series of capture fisheries. And this is the greenhouse gas uh, produced kilograms of CO2 equivalent per portion, 40 grams of protein, about a, sort of a standard hamburger or a piece of fish kind of a thing. And what you see is, and notice the, the y-axis is in logarithmic scale, enormous differences um, between uh, the real, the winner is small pelagic fishes, okay, sardines, anchovies, herring. If you think that carbon is the biggest environmental problem, you would not be a vegetarian, okay, you would be eating farmed mussels and things like that, and sardines. Well, mussels are great. Sardines, herring, anchovy. And I know, I know some pretty anti-fishing NGO people who have actually made that switch from being vegetarians or vegans. Um, I'm not gonna have a chance to go into that in much detail, but um, this is from a paper that just uh, came out two years ago, just looking at uh, people's diets and what the, green, the daily greenhouse gas footprint was, and the worst is people who eat a lot of meat. Next is people, a medium amount of meat, then low meat eaters, then fish eaters and vegetarians, very close, and vegans uh, uh, a little uh, lower. Um, now, if you were to be a selective fish eater, uh, I think you could beat being a vegan without a problem. Okay, everybody says, well, you shouldn't eat, you shouldn't eat fish, you should eat organic vegetables. Okay, now, as it happened, my wife, Ulrika, used to be an organic vegetable farmer, and we were just reminiscing of how, she said, how did I do that? Get up at four, go to bed at, mi at midnight for six months a year, but, uh, so she, she raised organic vegetables um, and uh, sold them at farmer's markets, also sold them to a number of Seattle restaurants, had a uh, community-supported agriculture, had about 90 customers at its peak, uh, delivering a box of vegetables each week. And everybody say, now that's a way you can produce food without a serious environmental impact. 
This is my son, who's also sitting in the front row, after he had prepared the field for planting in the spring. Now, um, they say picture is worth a thousand words. It's certainly worth a thousand data points. I would argue that there's not much vegetative biodiversity in that field because that's why we rototilled it, right? We wanted to get rid of all the vegetative biodiversity. And that is a characteristic of farming. And my son's a farmer. I used to be a partner with him in the farm. I know about farming. Uh, when I didn't get a job here, I went down in 1966, I went down to Dayton, Washington and picked peas for the Green Giant. Um, and uh, what farming does, well, so, oops, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a lot of loss of native biodiversity, but this is what that field looked like 100 years ago. That's northern temperate forest, and every farm field in, uh, in Washington involved either chopping down trees or, pl or plowing, plowing up grasslands. So there's enormous differences between agriculture and fishing. Major impacts of agriculture and livestock is to totally transform an ecosystem and replace the native vegetation with exotic species. A few fisheries impact primary producers, the equivalent of the grass or the trees. In fact, very few touch the second or even the third trophic level. Uh, that a well-managed fishery is a very natural system. It, we've just manipulated the ratios of some of the abundance. Um, just to, this is a paper on marine reserves. I'm using it, I'm gonna just skip by this to uh, make it simpler to understand. This is just comparing inside some marine reserves to outside, and what they found is that the abundance of fish was about 40% less than inside uh, due to fishing, that biomass was 30% less due to fishing, average size was 10% less, diversity was about 10% less. Fishing has impacts, okay? But I would argue, I think it doesn't, again, picture doesn't take, uh, explains it, that there's probably more loss of biodiversity in the, uh, the, 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 the portion of the world that's been turned over to food production, which is about 70% of the potential arable land in the world. And so this is just a picture from the Great Plains. Uh, the tall grass is gone. Okay, there's just a few remnants of tall grass prairie left. The prairie dogs are gone. Again, I mean, you can find little pockets of them. The black-tailed uh, black ferrets are gone. The buffalo are gone. And the wolves are gone. And the Great Plains have certainly been transformed much, much more than any American fishery has transformed a marine ecosystem. So I finally want to close by uh, another study group, and look, there's Anna Parma again, uh, uh, on what is probably the most controversial form of fishing, bottom trawling, okay? Bottom trawling, you drag nets of various kinds along the bottom of the ocean. This is from an unnamed NGO's website. Bottom trawling wipes out everything in its path. So two American foundations, the Packard Foundation and the Walton Foundation, funded us to put together uh, this group to really do a study of what is the impact of trawling on the benthic ecosystem uh, of the oceans. Uh, and and we've been, this, one, this has been a slow one. It's taken us four years because we've gathered a staggering amount of data. And so one thing we're doing is just looking at the trawl footprint. So the common perception is that trawling is everywhere. All the continental shelves are just scraped back and forth. If you, there's a lot of very fine, detailed spatial data available now from satellite tracking systems and things like that, that we can actually map very carefully where trawling is taking place. So this is the um, Bering Sea, and you see there's a real hot spot here, where a very, which is trawled very intensively. Uh, most of that area uh, in green is trawled less than once a year, and in white is not trawled at all. Um, on the right is uh, the major North Sea and waters around England and coastal France. Much more intense fishing there. Uh, that some areas are trawled, I'll show you, some areas are trawled uh, multiple times a year. So we've actually generated this data now for about 30 uh, different places around the world. Um, 
And so this is a map of just the Americas. Each of the circles is an area where we have the data. Uh, what you see in green is the proportion that is not trawled. So uh, area 20, which I think is Gulf of Alaska, that's about 80%. Um, uh, 18 is a Bering Sea, it's maybe 70%. Then what's in, uh, what's in the light green is a place that would be trawled less than once every 10 years. And then in yellow is somewhere between one every five to 10 years. In orange is one to five, uh, between one and five years. And in red is the places that are trawled more than uh, once or more a year. And you see for the Americas, um, you have at least half of the area typically untrawled. Uh, this is the, the big picture. Um, I'll just point out Europe is quite different. Europe is much more intense. Depending on where in Europe you are, you may only have, say, as low as 20 or 30 percent of the area that's not trawled. We can then take that data along with some other data I won't have time to talk about and just look at what's the effect on the benthic uh, of biota, that basically the animals that live in the bottom, not the target species, but the clams, the, the worms, the starfish, the corals, the sponges. And what we find is that the impact is very different depending upon what kind of bottom. Gravel is most, the most sensitive. Uh, mud is the least sensitive. Um, and this is for one area in Australia from a paper that our group has recently published. We'll be doing this for, for 20 or 30 regions. And what you see in this area is that 80, or no, 80 to 90 percent of the bottom is totally un, unaffected by trawling in terms of what the biota are on the bottom. Uh, now, just to wrap up, there are serious threats to sustaining food from the seas. Food security, what are the threats? I'd say the most direct is probably ocean acidification, that we know it's happening. We don't really understand what it's going to do, but uh, there's, you know, the physics are really simple. You have more carbon in, in the atmosphere. You've got some, it's not like climate modeling. This is really simple chemistry. Uh, the oceans are going to get more acidic. Uh, we don't know what that's going to mean. Uh, global warming is clearly happening. Uh, I'm not going to get into arguments about why it's happening, but I guarantee you, if you've worked in western Alaska for the last 20 years, you know it's happening. Uh, and that is changing the distribution of fish. Uh, it's going to cause changes. It's certainly going to threaten the sustainability of fisheries in some areas. It may, in fact, augment fisheries in other areas. Uh, poor fisheries management in places that can't regulate their fisheries. Uh, the sustainability of those fish resources is, is a serious concern. I would also list that closing large parts of the ocean to fishing is a threat to food security. So how many people know who Sylvia Earle is? Okay. She has 20 honorary PhDs. And I've been at meetings with her where she went to people from Pacific Islands and said, you should not eat fish. You should be eating coconuts. And Sylvia Earle argues that we should not fish the oceans at all. Um, I mean, I would say that attitude is totally anti-human. And she, I mean, I mean I, I've heard tales of her at a, at, a, at a meeting where they served a fish. She sent it back and said, bring me a steak, OK? She has no concept of the alternative costs of different kinds of seafood, of different kinds of foods. Um, now there's also quite a big movement right now to close the high seas to fishing. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, IUCN recently adopted a recommendation of closing 30% of the oceans to fishing. So this is a very real threat to the sustainability of food from the sea. Uh, can we sustain food from the seas? Certainly we can, and we are in many places. There are certainly challenges. Uh, poor governance and management, lack of science to provide advice. Um, another interesting one is conflicting objectives about what we want from the seas. So if we want to maximize food, we will behave differently than we want to maximize economic profit. Okay? And we would certainly behave very differently uh, depending upon how much emphasis a society places on environmental protection. Why do I remain an optimist? First, the trend in abundance and in managing fisheries is good in many places. That, uh, as, I've, as I've said, I, you know, probably a quarter to a, uh, um, approaching almost half of the world is now getting 
uh, world fish catch is now getting a management system that, that, is, has a, that shows that it'll work. Um, there is, uh, if the places that don't have it, again, Southeast Asia in particularly, there's a growing recognition by those countries that they need to uh, have effective management. Um, and that's, a, that's a, I mean, it'll take a while, but that's a, a very good sign. Um, what perhaps impresses me the most is the energy and dedication of the next generation of fisheries management, fishing groups, and fishery scientists. Uh, there are, as I say, thousands of people out there, whether they're observers on fishing boats uh, or uh, port samplers or counting or, or aging otoliths. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, you know, I just have to admire how much energy they have and where we're going. And I also, uh, the, the commitment of fishing communities and fishing industry to sustainability. Um, the fishing industry gets a lot of criticism, but what I, I mean, people just don't seem to understand is they have a much bigger stake in sustainability than anyone else. That's certainly a bigger stake than the NGOs or, uh, or people like you and me. That, uh, well, that there are several people here in, in this room that are, have bet millions and millions and millions of their own money that the fish resources will be sustained. And um, so as many of you may know, uh, uh, but just about a year ago in May, uh, Greenpeace launched a very public attack against me, arguing that uh, I had failed to disclose um, industry funding for research. In fact, the 35 papers or so that had published with industry funding had acknowledged it, and UW, Science Magazine, PNIS all uh, reviewed their arguments and said, no, he complied with all the cases. But ever since then, I felt compelled to just give an overview of where all this research that I've been involved in and, and sort of my end of things has come from. Uh, about 50% of it has come from U.S. foundations who are who have been uh, fantastic in their interest in, uh, in marine and, uh, and fisheries research, about 25% from government, about 3% from NGOs, although actually that's growing at the moment. Uh, about 13% of it has come from the fishing industry, about 9% what I would call community groups. These are groups up in Alaska. Um, where does that money go? Uh, the Alaska money, which is a good portion of it, goes to pay to run our field camps and to pay the staff. Uh, and a lot of the industry money, the, a number of nor, uh, Northeast Pacific companies, some of them represented here, have been uh, big donors to help us maintain this RAM legacy database. So I want to close. Again, going back, that those of us who do the synthetic and talk the big picture could not do so if it wasn't for thousands and thousands of people who go out and, uh, and, and do work at sea or on land to collect the kinds of data. And, and those of us at the analytic end are totally dependent on them. And I uh, just want to close reminding you that this is about food. These are all different kinds of food, different kinds of, uh, of, fo of fish products, some fishermen, some boats. I mean, that's what, it, you know, when you think of the ocean, we need to think about it as a, a major food production system comparable with the production of, of livestock on, on land. So thank you very much. <laughs>